Thank you so much, uh, my dear colleagues uh, and the professors uh, for inviting me for this lecture. Um, this has been, I think, five or six years that uh, I have been presenting in this meeting annually. Um, use of precision medicine in management of osteoporosis in CKD patients. It's a kind of catchy and appealing uh, uh, title. Uh, the problem with osteoporosis management uh, in general in CKD patients is that we have a big gap. Um, this is unacceptable gap in osteoporosis management. Most of the nephrologists, they don't know exactly how they can treat uh, the osteoporosis and bone loss in our CKD patients in general. And now I'm going to talk to you and help you how to um, be more precise and accurate and treat your patients better. Uh, this uh, lecture from my dear professor uh, and colleague, Dr. Hassan Shaisha, uh, God bless her, his soul, he inspired me for this uh, talk. A couple months ago, just three weeks before he passed away, he gave this nice lecture about using precision medicine in nephrology in the first uh, annual meeting for the pharma, uh, pharma um, uh, meeting in Mansoura. And uh, he gave very, very nice, um, elegant lecture about using the precision medicine. I really advocate and recommend you guys uh, watching his YouTube video. Um, I think I have to say that I don't have anything to disclose for uh, this lecture. I'm part of uh, multiple randomized controlled trials, but none of them are uh, involving any of the osteoporosis uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, agents or uh, interventions. The objectives of my talk today, I will give you a brief uh, description of what is the precision medicine and we'll focus on osteoporosis uh, management gap that we need to fill in. Then I will walk you through the bone turnover biomarker that we use to identify the pathophysiology of osteoporosis and to help us uh, to treat our um, CKD patients with osteoporosis. Then we'll talk about the clinical usefulness and the limitation of using these biomarkers. So we have to distinguish between uh, two kinds of interventions and management approach. First is the traditional medicine um, that you identify patient with a disease, then you treat every uh, single patient with this disease equally. So maybe some of this patient will get benefit but other category of patients might not get benefit and a third uh, portion of this patient may develop adverse events even without getting the beneficial side of the medicine. Moving from the traditional medicine to a precision medicine, it's approach to be more precise, more accurate, to decrease the side effects, to treat every patient differently as a unique and a special patient, to identify the pathophysiology of the disease rather than to treat everybody the same. So precision medicine is actually a medical model that proposes customization of healthcare so we can tailor the medical decision, the diagnosis, and the management for every single patient. Um, in contrast, a stratified medicine is just to identify subgroup of patient. How can we deal with each subgroup of patient with the same disease differently? Personalized medicine is uh, using integrated multidisciplinary approach to treat uh, the patient and to, to tailor individual uh, intervention. While person-centered uh, approach is to focus on the patient perspectives, not from the healthcare side, but just for patient side. Maybe the patient with cancer, his main problem is uh, pain management. Maybe 
uh, and you know, young lady, her uh, major concern is not to lose her, her hair, or uh, you know, she has uh, some issues with uh, conception. So try to focus on the patient side, not the doctor or the health care side. So individualized medicine, or we call it personalized medicine, or precision medicine, is to treat the right uh, patient with the right drug at the right time. So uh, the question is, does one side fit all? And the answer is not. Uh, no one responds to the same treatment exactly the same as others respond. Every patient should be treated as a unique patient. To make it uh, more precise and accurate, so we have this group of patients uh, with the same pathology, say hypertension, then the precision medicine is not to treat everybody the same by using beta blocker or calcium channel blocker or ACE or, or, or ARBs, but using the science of omics, you know, the genomics, transcriptomics, epigenomics, proteomics, phosphoproteomics, and metabolomics, we can identify exactly what is the problem, then we can intervene accordingly. So for example, we can use the genome which is a, a DNA mapping of the patient to identify if there is any gene mutation, or we can use the transcriptomic, which is using the messenger RNA, so just one fold um, with the protein coding region abnormality we identify for the disease, or we can use the proteomics, which is a protein uh, end product of the gene mutation, or we can use the metabolomics, which is the metabolic activities of the disease. So if we understand uh, these different levels of abnormality and do intervene, we can very precisely treat our patient. As you see here, um, just last month, November 2020, the European Consensus a committee has published this article and they said there is unacceptable osteoporosis management gap in treating patients with CKD, MBD, especially patients with stage four and five D. And they uh, recommend uh, filling in this gap proactively and try to limit the fragility fracture and to prevent future fracture. Then they came up with this nice algorithm. So we risk stratify our CKD patients according to their age, their um, gender, their BMI, the high risk of a fracture. And we do a DEXA scan, including vertebral fracture assessment. We put the patient in a lateral position to detect any uh, vertebral fracture. And according to the DEXA scan and the vertebral fracture assessment, if the patient has high risk of fracture, we call it fracture risk assessment tool, the FRAX. So if the patient is osteoporotic or has high risk of a fracture or especially fragility fracture, we need to intervene. So first of all, we need to control the patient CKD, MBD, metabolic abnormalities, so control the serum phosphorus, calcium, vitamin D level, BTH. You know, if there is acidosis, we need to treat acidosis. Then we need to use bone turnover marker to identify the pathology of the osteoporosis. And sometimes actually we need to do bone histomorphometry, so do bone biopsy to see exactly what's going on in the bone. Every patient has to be treated with lifestyle modification, healthy lifestyle, including proper nutrition, vitamin D therapy, weight bearing exercise, physical activity, uh, intervention to prevent falls. And if the patient is a smoker, we need to advocate for cessation of smoking. Then some of our patients with bone loss, they might benefit for either from anti-resorptive therapies 
or bone forming therapies. Then we need to follow up this patient to see their response and compliance with medication using bone uh, turnover marker. So what is uh, the biomarkers? We usually use non-invasive biomarkers. And the definition, as you can see here, the biomarker is any measurable indicator of a state of body. So if you check blood pressure, it's a measurable indicator of a state of body. So it's a biomarker. Using glucometer to check the blood sugar is a biomarker. Serum creatinine, for example, is a, is a biomarker for the kidney function. And urine analysis also is one of the biomarkers that we are using. So we are here talking about using bone turnover markers to assess and to follow our patients. So first of all, we need to understand what's bone turnover. So our bones are in a constant state of bone modeling and remodeling. So there is four stages for bone remodeling. First is bone resorption. So to have new bone formation, you have to start by taking out the old cracked bone. Then uh, this happens through the osteoclasts that erode the bone surface and create a cavity. And this cavity, this is the first stage of uh, uh, bone remodeling uh, through bone resorption. Then there is a stage of bone reversal when the osteoblasts comes in and prepare the surface for bone formation, which is the stage three bone formation, the osteoblast replace the old bone and fill in the cavity. Then the bone um, enters in a resting stage. So bone turnover happens all the time. Bone remodeling is a continuous process. The problem with our CKD patients, they are either uh, have tendency to have low or high turnover bone disease, and if they have low turnover bone disease, their bone is senile. It's premature bone senility and aging process that happen. So their bone is unhealthy. It is uh, full of uh, cracks and micro fracture that is very hard to heal. And there is micro damage and over mineralized bone. On the other side of the spectrum, they also tend to have high turnover bone disease, very hard to maintain normal bone turnover. So if they end up by having high turnover bone disease, they will lose bone, there will be a stress uh, fracture and under mineralized bone. To make it more easy, uh, let us just uh, you know have a virtual case here uh, that we are facing uh, very, very often in our dialysis clinic. This is a nice 60-year-old female with a history of type 2 diabetes and end-stage kidney disease, and she is on dialysis for two years. She slept uh, in her bathroom, and she had a left hip fracture. Uh, her hip fracture was successfully treated surgically, and she came back to your dialysis clinic. So this lady has a fragility fracture, just a minor fall in her bathroom, end up by having a major uh, fracture. This is by definition called osteoporotic fracture. And as you see here, her serum calcium was okay, 9.8, mild hyperphosphatemic, BTH 159, hemoglobin is a little bit okay. She's hypoalbuminemic, probably because she stayed in the hospital. Uh, with bone neutrition and this uh, fracture fixation. Then alkaline phosphatase 108. Then DEXA scan was done as, as you can see here, the T-score is minus 2.6. So she has osteoporosis and uh, she has osteoporotic fracture. How can we treat this patient? This is a medical dilemma that we are facing. Um, so to precisely uh, manage this patient and diagnose this patient. We did bone-specific alkaline phosphatase, which is a biomarker of bone formation, and it was on the lower side. And we did a trap 5 b which is a biomarker of bone resorption, and it was also on the lower side, so this patient probably have low turnover bone disease. 
To be more precise, we did a bone biopsy for this patient. As you can see here, there is uh, no unmineralized bone, and the, you know there is a lot of adipocytes here, and the bone mass and volume was low. So this patient has low bone turnover osteoporosis. So how can we treat this patient? So um, first of all, traditionally, low turnover bone disease is associated with increased the calcium intake and the calcium containing phosphate binder and use of calcium mimetic and uh, you know sinacalcet uh, and the vitamin D analog as well. So in this patient, we decreased uh, the dialysate calcium. We stopped the calcium containing uh, uh, lowering agents. And we stopped also the vitamin D analogs. Then we followed up this patient only with labs, including the traditional lab that we do usually for our patient every month. So her BTH went up, her phosphorus went down nicely, alkaline phosphatase went a little bit up, and bone specific alkaline phosphatase, a marker of bone formation, increased significantly. So this patient responded very well to the traditional. Uh, approach so we don't have to do anything else and after two years we repeated the DEXA scan and there was significant improvement in her DEXA scores with the T-scores so that's that's good so we now we know how to treat our patients and uh, we treated her uh, you know with a traditional approach and she, she responded very well okay on the other hand let us see this uh, second patient we with the same number, we treated this patient with a traditional approach. But as you see here, one specific alkaline phosphate is trap 5P, and the other parameter didn't improve. So we have to treat low bone turnover uh, bone disease by a bone, uh, you know, um, stimulant. So we used Forteo, and we treated this patient for a year with Forteo, and you see the response. You know, the bone specific alkaline phosphate is and trap 5P went up. So this patient didn't respond to traditional uh, intervention, but responded to the non-traditional approach. On the other hand, as you see this patient, probably this patient has high turnover bone disease because bone formation rate is high, but bone resorption probably is, is, is very high. So this patient is losing bone because of high turnover bone disease. We treated this patient with a traditional approach using vitamin D and logs and using calcium mimetics. And as you see here, the uh, bone-specific alkaline phosphatase went down and TRAP5B uh, went down. So we can control the high turnover bone disease just with traditional um, intervention. Same patient, uh, as you see here, didn't respond to traditional uh, intervention. So we have to treat this high turnover bone disease by another anti-resorptive therapy. So we choose to treat this patient with dinozumab, which is a rank L uh, monoclonal antibody, and this patient responds. So, you know, treating, you know, patients with osteoporosis, with CKD, MBD, the approach might be different. And uh, this is what we call very size medicine. And this is just to avoid having osteitis fibrosa and very high turnover bone disease with bone loss and on the other side, also to avoid low uh, turnover bone disease or adynamic bone disease. To be more precise, we sometimes need to do bone biopsy. And as you see here, bone biopsy can give you the different spectrum of bone pathology in our CKD MBD patient with osteoporosis. This spectrum is the high turnover bone disease, or what we call it, osteitis fibrosa. So you see, a lot of giant osteoclast, multinucleated osteoclast that uh, you know induce bone resorption, and you see a lot of osteoclast, and here is unmineralized bone and a lot of uh, bone marrow fibrosis. On the other hand, you see this other spectrum with low turnover bone disease. So this is acellular. You don't see it. you know osteoclast or osteoblast, and the bone volume is is low, and here you see a uh, different spectrum um, with uh, osteodystrophy and osteomalacia. So you see a lot of unmineralized, uh, thick, uh, unmineralized bone. Uh, so this is probably, we see it more in, in children 
with vitamin D deficiency and hypophosphatemic records. And here is a mixed lesion. So it's very important to understand the pathology of osteoporosis in our CKD patient. Using the bone turnover marker, the major advantage of that, it identifies the mechanism of bone loss. Is it low or, or high turnover bone disease? Then it predicts bone loss and fracture in our CKD patient. On the other hand, also it helps to select the treatment. Are we going to treat the high bone turnover uh, with, with anti-resorptive agents, or are we dealing with low bone formation re rate and we need to use osteoanabolic agents? Also to monitor the response of the treatment, because just waiting a year or two to repeat the DEXA scan is, you know, might be too late. The pathology of the patient uh, Pathology is not improving, the patient will have significant bone loss. Also to monitor the patient offset of the treatment after stopping the treatment, how does the patient do? So here is how to use the precise medicine and the follow up of our patient using either DEXA scan or using the uh, bone turnover marker. So to be very precise, you need to, you know, repeat the DEXA scan in two years. Here, this is a precision, uh, gap and just in three months you can fill in this gap using bone markers you don't wait why to wait two years if you can just use a simple non-invasive biomarker to uh, give you an impression about the response to treatment so the using the bone turnover marker is complementary it doesn't replace the DEXA scan it, it uh, actually improves the precision of the DEXA scan. And also the bone turnover biomarker, it doesn't diagnose osteoporosis, but helps you to identify the pathology. So you need to use DEXA scan to diagnose osteoporosis, but to follow up this patient and to, you know, to check on their response to therapy, you need to use the biomarker. So, and the idea is, you know, there is no uh, single drugs fits all patients. As you see here, the thera therapeutic intervention to our patients using non-traditional approach is using either anti-resorptive therapy or osteoanabolic, and the anti-resorptive therapies might be using bisphosphonates, dinozumab, uh, selective esterase receptor mediator, or calcitonin. On the other hand, if the problem is low bone formation, uh, we can use osteoanabolics, either teriparatide, abaloparatide, or uh, romosozumab. So bone turnover markers are essential. There are many of them. I just want you to focus on bone-specific alkaline phosphatase as a biomarker of bone formation and TRAB5B as a biomarker of bone resorption because other biomarkers like osteocalcin, B1 and B and CTX, NTX, all of these uh, biomarker are cleared at least partially by the kidney, so their usefulness in CKD patients remain unclear, while TRAB5B, BSAB, and the combination with IBTH, it's very useful in CKD uh, Other alternative is just to use the total alkaline phosphatase. If you have difficulty uh, assessing the bone-specific alkaline phosphatase, you still can use the um, you know, total alkaline phosphate is very important, very simple tool. You see here in this study, they examined, uh, you know, more than 185,000 Japanese hemodialysis patients. They uh, examined the um, usefulness of using total alkaline phosphatase. And actually, the higher serum alkaline phosphatase was independent uh, biomarker, not only with the mortality, but also with the hip fracture in such patient. So you see here, vision was high, um, you know, a total alkaline phosphatase was associated with hip fracture and mortality. So total alkaline phosphatase has very good predictive value and it's uh, very simple, widely available, inexpensive and part of our routine biomarker. Of course, if you compare total alkaline phosphatase to bone specific alkaline phosphatase, the bone specific alkaline phosphatase has better precision, better prediction uh, compared to the total alkaline phosphatase. But I mean, if you just 
uh, have any difficulty using the bone specific alkaline phosphates, you can still use the total alkaline phosphates. Here is another uh, way to use the BTH and bone specific alkaline phosphates to have a specificity of 100 and both the predictive value of 100. So if you have a BTH less than 200 and you have bone specific alkaline phosphates of less than 20, this uh, you know has very good specificity and both the predictive value for low turnover bone disease. So having bone specific alkaline phosphates over 20 virtually exclude a dynamic bone disease, especially if the BTH is more than 200. Here is very nice study that has um, done histomorphometry for uh, you know CKD patient. As you see, low turnover bone disease was very prevalent in this cohort of patients compared to high turnover bone disease. They did bone histology for almost 500 patients. If you use the KDGO guideline, you know two to nine folds of upper uh, limit of normal for the BTH is that sensitivity and the specificity with um, you know less than two folds increase of BTH is very low. You can still miss about one third of patient. The highest uh, uh, you know is the specificity for BTH more than nine uh, folds. So if you have a BTH more than six hundred or so, you uh, have very uh, good um, a chance with a higher specificity of 85.8%, but you still can miss about 15% of these patients without having high turnover bone disease. So the idea of using the biomarkers is to decide which uh, you know, treatment you need to, to do, then you check compliance, and according to the response in six months, you can intervene by changing the medicine or uh, changing the dose, uh, or using different approach. And in 12 months, you can check the DEXA scan to see uh, if there is comparable um, effect. As you see here, this is uh, how we use denosumab to treat uh, the low uh, bone mineral density uh, after uh, kidney transplantation. And as you see here, in six months and 12 months, you see the change of BMD, but you can see this earlier with using different uh, biomarkers, especially bone-specific alkaline phosphatase. Also, you can all, you know, check the response after you stop the medicine. So here is the placebo. Uh, this is the CTX, which is a marker of bone resorption. Here, bone-specific alkaline phosphatase, a marker of bone formation. As you see here, after stopping denosumab, you see significant increase in the bone resorption and significant increase in bone formation. So probably you have higher turnover bone disease after stopping. So the medicine, so these biomarker actually help you to understand what's going on uh, with the patient on the medicine and off the medicine. To conclude, uh, osteoporosis and CKD patient is not one disorder. It's it's different disorder. We need to identify the pathophysiology of osteoporosis and the mechanism behind it. It's, uh, there is an acceptable um, management gap in treating osteoporosis in our CKD patients. We have to fill in, or at least try to fill in this gap. Using a bone turnover biomarker helps in osteoporosis management, in diagnosis, and follow-up of therapy, in choosing the uh, best therapy, and also to uh, examine the response on the medicine and of the medicine later on. Mistreating osteoporotic patients uh, with CKD is devastating, and actually it doesn't only increase fracture rate, but also increase mortality. So we have to be proactive, and we have to try to avoid bone loss in our patients. So I think we learned something today, and uh, education is not enough. We have to change this to an action. We have to uh, build up this and incorporate this to our practice so we can um, actually help our patients in the future. Thank you so much for listening and hopefully next year I can meet with you in person. Thank you.